After three failed attempts to complete the critical fueling test of its gigantic space launch system rocket, NASA has decided to roll back the Mega Moon rocket from the launch pad to the vehicle assembly building for various repairs, further delaying the rocket's long-anticipated first launch. The wet dress rehearsal test campaign began on April 1 and was supposed to wrap up two days later with the fueling of the SLS and some practice launch countdowns. After two attempts to load the cryogenic stages on the rocket with propellants were scrubbed on April 3 and 4, the third attempt was called off on April 14 after engineers found a leak of liquid hydrogen from the base of the rocket's mobile launcher, which connects to its core stage. The leak was discovered during liquid hydrogen loading operations, and the team was unable to complete the test due to the mishap. When teams paused propellant loading, the rocket's core stage liquid oxygen tank was about 49% filled, and the liquid hydrogen tank had been loaded to about 5% capacity prior to the hydrogen leak. Before ending the test, teams also met test objectives for the interim cryogenic propulsion stage by chilling down the lines used to load propellant into the upper stage. However, they did not flow any propellant to the stage because of an issue with a helium check valve identified several days ago. In a statement released by NASA on April 16, the agency said that they will roll SLS and Orion back to the vehicle assembly building to replace a faulty upper stage check valve and a small leak on the tail service mast umbilical. NASA did not specify when the vehicle would return to the vehicle assembly building from Launch Complex 39B, it appears likely that it will take a week or so. After resolving the issues, the agency will roll the rocket back to the pad and attempt to complete the wet dress rehearsal test once again. The rocket would then be rolled back to the assembly building to arm the flight safety system, charge the batteries on the Orion spacecraft, and update the flight computer software on SLS before being rolled back to the launch pad for a third time for liftoff. The earliest the SLS rocket could launch in such a scenario appears to be August. The James Webb Space Telescope is one step closer to probing the depths of the universe. NASA announced on April 13 that the final instrument aboard the observatory, called the Mid-Infrared Instrument, finally achieved its operating temperature of 6.4 kelvins. The Mid-Infrared Instrument has both a camera and a spectrograph that sees the light in the mid-infrared region of the electromagnetic spectrum. Since its launch on December 25, the telescope has been cooling to the freezing temperatures required to detect infrared light accurately. The recently achieved temperature milestone is an important step in Webb's multi-phase six-month commissioning process to align its mirrors and prepare its instruments for deep space observations. The team intends to take more test images of stars and other objects in the coming days to ensure that the mid-infrared instrument is functioning properly. NASA's 1.8 kg Mars helicopter, Ingenuity, aced its 25th flight on the Red Planet on April 8, setting new personal bests for speed and distance. It broke its distance and ground speed records, traveling 704 meters at 5.5 meters per second, while flying for 161.3 seconds. According to Ingenuity's flight log, the greatest distance covered by the helicopter had been 625 meters, achieved during a flight in July 2021. Its previous speed record was 5 meters per second, which it reached on multiple flights. The 25th sortie did not break any records for duration or altitude. The current duration record is 169.5 seconds, set during a flight in August 2021, and the altitude record is 12 meters, reached by the helicopter in July and August 2021. In the months ahead, history's first aircraft to operate from the surface of another world will support the Perseverance rover's upcoming science campaign, exploring the ancient river delta of Jezero Crater. Along the way, it will continue testing its own capabilities to support the design of future Mars Air vehicles. Python is a small space company with grand ambitions of sending craft to the Moon and Mars, while operating with a small team to keep costs low. On March 19, the California-based small launch company conducted a single-engine hold-down test of the first stage of its Iger rocket. The video of the test went largely unnoticed until last week. The rocket's Asterix engine, which operates at a chamber pressure of 10 MPa fired for about 9.7 seconds during the test. According to the company's blog post, the micro-jump was a success, with the stage moving maybe a foot or two off the ground. With the successful ground test, the company showed that the rocket can take off safely and that the components will not all fall apart when subjected to extreme stress. However, at one point in the test video, a handful of employees can be seen running from the cloud of red dust kicked up by the burning hypergolic fuel. 
The footage prompted hundreds of criticisms from experts and rocket scientists, citing staff members' dangerous proximity not only to a live rocket engine test, but also to the toxic gas cloud emanating from that test. According to Python Space, they are not amused by internet mockery, and the company was simply showing the other side of aerospace engineering that competing companies wouldn't dare. The company explained that they strictly adhere to the FAA's launch requirements, and the rocket runs on green fuel, which does not produce the toxic clouds that other rockets do. In my opinion, what Python is doing is undeniably impressive, and the company founders certainly show their determination, but such accomplishments should not come at the expense of employee safety. On Friday, April 15, a Shenzhou spacecraft carrying three astronauts safely landed in northern China's Inner Mongolia, about nine hours after departing from the Tianhe core module of the country's Jiangong space station. As part of the Shenzhou 13 mission, astronauts Zhai Zhigang, Wang Yaping, and Yi Guangfu spent six months aboard the orbiting station. This is the longest space flight ever undertaken by a Chinese crew. The astronauts performed two spacewalks, conducted more than 20 science experiments, and prepared the station for future expansion during their stay aboard the orbital outpost. Shenzhou-13 was Tianhe's second crewed mission, which launched to low Earth orbit in October 2021. Shenzhou-14, the next long-duration crewed mission to the Chinese space station, will be launched in June. Now, let's discuss some of the major Starship updates from the past week. SpaceX is getting ready to put together its second Starship orbital launch pad and launch tower at Kennedy Space Center Launch Complex 39A. Pad 39A is one of the busiest launch pads in the world, so the tower construction will have to contend with frequent delays caused by launch operations. As a result, SpaceX is currently planning to prefabricate all nine sections of the tower at its Roberts Road facility before transporting them all to Pad 39A for stacking. On the other hand, at Starbase, SpaceX constructed more than two or three tower sections at a time before transporting and stacking each completed section at the launch site. In order to complete the launch tower at Kennedy much faster than the first, SpaceX will have to optimize the manufacturing process of the tower sections. Although it is still early in the construction process, this deep dive article by Zach Golden, published on StoryMaps.com, gives us an insight into SpaceX's plans. Close inspection of Section 1 of the tower reveals that the rails through which the rocket catching and stacking arm will travel have been pre-installed on the columns at Kennedy. It was only after all the tower sections were assembled that those rails were installed on the launch tower at Starbase. Furthermore, the lower stop points for the tower arms were also pre-installed on the first tower section at Kennedy. The purpose of this wedge-shaped metal structure is to provide a surface for the chopsticks to rest on while being serviced. They were added much later in the construction process at the Starbase. The Starship Quick Disconnect arm was installed on the fifth section of the launch tower at Starbase. This arm is used to stabilize the booster while stacking, as well as to fuel the Starship before launch. Attaching the QD arm to the launch tower is accomplished by mounting hinge supports onto one of the columns of the fifth section of the tower. As seen in this photo, those mounting brackets were installed alongside several other large beams after the tower sections were stacked at the Starbase launch site. You can clearly see that getting those structures to the top of the tower for installation was not an easy process. Therefore, to reduce the amount of work required and speed things up, SpaceX plans to install those mounting brackets and support beams before the tower sections are stacked at the Pad 39A site. This is one of the most recent images of launch tower sections being built at the SpaceX facility on Roberts Road. SpaceX has begun affixing mounting brackets to a column of the third tower section currently being constructed. We know that the Starship QD arm will be located on the fifth section of the tower, so it is safe to assume that this third section being constructed at Kennedy is actually the fifth section of the launch tower. But why did SpaceX skip sections 3 and 4 and went straight to section 5? According to Zach Golden's observations, there is a compelling reason to do so. As you can see, there is a lot of pipework in the fifth section of the tower at Starbase, and SpaceX spent a lot of time and effort to get these pipings there and install them. Therefore, in order to reduce the workload this time around, it seems that SpaceX plans to complete all piping work on the ground before the tower sections are stacked at Pad 39A. Still, installing all of the pipework will take time, so it's a good idea to start Section 5 as soon as possible to avoid disrupting the flow of work later in the project. There are a lot more minor design changes on the tower that is being constructed at Kennedy. You can read them in detail in this deep dive article. I will provide the link to the write-up in the description. 
Now, let's move on to the updates from Starbase. SpaceX's upgraded 33-engine Super Heavy prototype, Booster 7, passed its first structural testing on April 14. The test used 13 hydraulic rams to assess the structural integrity of the booster's newly upgraded 13-engine thrust puck. First, the booster was filled with liquid nitrogen about a third of the way. When the rocket was fully chilled, large sheets of ice that had formed on the side of Booster 7's skin broke apart and fell off, indicating some kind of added stress. Only the ice near Super Heavy's base was visibly disturbed, raising the possibility that the behavior was caused by the structural test stand's hydraulic ram simulating Raptor engines. It's possible that Booster 7 isn't finished with structural testing yet. SpaceX may also want to simulate engine-out scenarios that will result in asymmetric thrust. A few of the test stand's hydraulic rams will be activated during the engine-out test to simulate the asymmetric thrust produced by the active Raptor engines. If Booster 7 passes these structural tests and SpaceX is pleased with its performance, the prototype could be ready for Raptor installation and static fire testing in the near future. Prototype fabrication and assembly works are progressing rapidly at the build site. The nose cone barrel section of Starship 24 was recently moved into the high bay for stacking. Starship 24, the first Starship prototype likely to reach orbit, is also a cargo Starship pathfinder. Instead of a large alligator-like payload bay, all Starship would need is a comparatively tiny slot with a mechanical deployment mechanism to deploy cargoes such as Starlink satellites and other payloads into orbit. SpaceX had previously installed a satellite dispenser in Ship 24's nose cone barrel section. Satellites would first be loaded one by one into this dispenser, and once in orbit, the stack of satellites would be ejected one at a time through the payload slot. In a March video, we mentioned that SpaceX intends to replace all Starbase's construction tents with a 28,000-square-meter structure that will be approximately 18 meters high, 250 meters long, and 120 meters wide. Floor works for that advanced Starship factory are progressing, and a recent aerial shot taken by RGV aerial photography reveals that some vertical columns and roof structures have already arrived on site. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.